Hi there, and welcome back. Today I start with a story about a man, I don't know how to say his name, but I'm going to guess, Emidio Ovici, who was born in 1877 in a small village near Venice, Italy. His widowed mother used to read Emidio all of the letters that his uncle sent back from America. And so Emidio loved hearing about America, and he told everyone that he was going to go there someday. And by the time he was 11 years old, his family had helped him save enough money for an immigrant's ticket to America. And so he set sail for America all by himself at 11 years old. Now, one story says that Emilio had no money for food, and so his mother gave him a sack of peanuts to eat. And on the 10-day trip across the ocean, when he arrived in America, he went to work as a bellhop and a helper at a fruit stand at 11 years old. He worked hard, he saved his money, as he promised his mother that he would do. But Emilio soon learned that Americans liked the peanuts that he shared with them on occasion, but nobody seemed to grow them locally. So he found a place to plant a handful of the peanuts that he had left. And while his peanuts were growing, he saved enough money to buy himself a horse and wagon. When his peanut crop came in, he drove around calling himself the peanut specialist, selling roasted peanuts. And by 1906, he had developed his own method of blanching and roasting peanuts and founded the Planters Peanuts Corporation, headquartered in Suffolk, Virginia. Now, with only a handful of peanuts left in his possession, he had a choice of what he could do with them. Now, for those who came into worship physically on this day that you're hearing this message, everybody took a handful of peanuts. And like Amidio, they have choices then about what they're going to do with that handful of nuts. And today the Apostle Paul is going to advise us on the benefits of being generous with what we have. According to his letter to the church in Corinth, we are to go nuts with our giving. So as you prepare your heart for worship, do so knowing that you have choices to make with what it is you have. And allow the Holy Spirit to open your spirit to the truth God has for you today. So as people were asked to meditate about their peanuts, they had choices to make with what they can do with those nuts. And I knew that some people would want to eat them. And you could do that, right? Once those nuts are in your hands, they're yours to do with what you will. And those nuts taste good when you eat them, but only for a moment, and then there's nothing left. You could hide the nuts in your pocket and keep them for a later time, but in your pocket, they can get covered in lint and dirt and other junk, and they could even be forgotten. When you put them there, you might never remember that those peanuts were in your pocket. Or you could decide, you know what, maybe, maybe I'd eat some now and maybe then give the rest away. And that sounds fair and reasonable. We all have to nourish ourselves and eat, and we all want to serve. So giving the rest away enables us to share in the blessing. Or we could decide to give 10% of our peanuts to God, knowing he will then bless the remaining 90% we have. 10% is, of course, the biblical tithing amount. And it is part of the Old Testament covenant with Israel. However, the New Testament goes further under our new covenant of grace. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are saved by grace because we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and we were created to do good works through the example of Jesus Christ. So then what would Jesus do with a handful of nuts 
Now, whether we do our giving in the Old Testament sense of tithing or the New Testament sense of grace, we have a choice to make. We hold in our hands what God has given us freely and abundantly. And God has taught us what his expectations are for what he has given us. And today the Apostle Paul will give us the motivation to go nuts in our giving. So we're reading today from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. And listen for the motivation for us to be generous in our giving. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result and thanksgiving to God. Now, we begin unpacking this in verse 6 um, with this warning. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. This is a very fundamental principle that Paul states. God blesses us in proportion to what we sow for him. And this pertains to all areas of our lives, and not just our finances. How do we know that? Well, because Paul then uses the example of the farmer to show us how this works in the agricultural world. If a farmer plants just a little bit, he's going to harvest just a little bit. But if a farmer plants a lot, he will harvest a lot. And if he plants a lot, he'll have a lot more at harvest time perhaps even abundance to share with others. Now, the point of verse 6 is that we're asked by God to plant what he has given us and multiply it. Giving is about planting seeds of all kinds that grow for God, our time, our talents, our gifts, and our service. And the investment that you make will yield an abundant result if you are truly putting God's kingdom first. The principle here is that if you plant peas, you're going to grow peas. If you plant corn, you're going to grow corn. But if you want a high value product, then you have to invest in high grade seeds. If you want God's best blessing in your life, then you have to give him the best of what you have first. And Jesus himself tells us that this is true. And it's recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, with it will be measured back. God will not skimp on the return. Give in good measure and blessings will be poured into your lap. Now, we've all heard the expression that we reap what we sow. But the truth is that if you sow for God, you simply will reap more than you sow. Did you know that if you go home and just plant one of those peanuts that we talked about, what could happen? You would get a whole bush of peanuts. One kernel of corn can produce a whole stock with two to three ears containing hundreds more kernels of corn. But you know what happens in this time in between when we plant that seed and we get this harvest? We have to wait because this doesn't happen overnight. Multiplying gifts takes time. Planting and harvesting takes time. That's why Paul is using this example. It's not instantaneous. So how do we know how many peanuts we should eat in, out of our hand and how many should we plant? 
Well, verse 7 tells us how the principles of harvesting should work. And we can return to the farmer for another good illustration and deciding what it is to give. How do farmers decide how much seed they need to plant? The farmer has the freedom to plant only one of his fields or all of his fields. It's up to him, right? And the choice is ours well, as we consider what we will do with what we have. The point is, is that we should be intentional and thoughtful about our giving in every way. Now, I don't know a great deal about farming. I'm a city girl, <laughs> but I've seen fields and I've seen planted fields and I've seen them all being very neat and orderly. Seeds are not just scattered haphazardly. They are in rows and rows of neatly planted produce. Maybe that's because farmers make a plan about what to plant with an eye on the end result. What will the harvest be? And once it is time to purchase the seed, the farmer does so trusting that there's going to be a great result. And so he doesn't plant begrudgingly because he plants with hope, with expectation of a bountiful harvest from his work. And that's a joyful thought. And thinking what can be done with the harvest makes you a cheerful giver. So if we plant our handful of peanuts in God's field, what can we expect then to happen? And in verse 8, it says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Just look at all the superlatives that Paul uses there to remind us that we just simply cannot outgive God. Giving away part of our possessions shouldn't make us worry because of God's ability and God's will. He will provide not only what it is you need, but then more than you can even give away. I'm reminded of our collection that we did last month for the fast food for first responders. We collected snacks for the first responders in our state line area. And we had so much collected that this very thing that God promised manifested itself in our basement. We had too many donations to give them all to our intended responders. So what we did is we took all this excess that you see in the photo to the food pantry. And so we were able to share the excess with them. Because when you give, God blesses in abundance. And Paul then quotes from Psalm 112, verse 9, in order to confirm this teaching. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Now keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that in a few moments. But God promises us that if we are good givers, he will give us more opportunities to be even better givers. Paul says here that God will not only supply, but he will increase your return. What God is promising is more blessings to do more good works. And Paul is comparing what God has done in the physical world with these blessings with what God does for us spiritually. The farmer plants a crop and gets back more seed than he sowed. And similarly, those who sow spiritually by giving sacrificially to others will receive more spiritual seed namely the ability to continue to help more people. Because God doesn't just supply, he multiplies as well. And verse 11 tells us that we will be enriched in every way. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And some versions of your Bible out there say that you will be made rich in every way. Now God is not promising to make you rich if you start giving away what you have. I like this NIV version better that says enriched because it is far more accurate. Part of the definition of enriched is to render opulent in every way. I think that's awesome. You will be rendered opulent in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now these last two verses 
that we just read, um, verses 10 and 11, are really an explanation of how we apply that quoted verse from verse 9 that I told you to hold on to for just a moment ago. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Now, when we read these verses from Scripture, we think of material blessings only. Yet we have to remember that there is nothing that God won't bless us with if we give it to him first. And we know that he can bless our finances, our fitness, our families, and our futures. But what Paul is emphasizing here by quoting the Old Testament is that our righteousness will endure forever. What will grow the most? Our righteousness. And what exactly is righteousness? Well, if you recall, it is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And fruits of the Spirit are not conditions that we can achieve on our own. The, uh, they are only achievable through the union that we have with the Holy Spirit inside of us. Righteousness is the outgrowth of the heart of God. So a righteous person has a heart for honesty, kindness, meekness, goodness, those other fruits of the Spirit. And it's the culmination of the character that we get by pro produced by accepting Jesus Christ into our lives. And the fruit of righteousness springs from a seed that God plants in our heart at salvation. And without God planting that seed in there, this fruit would not be possible. Without the Holy Spirit nurturing it, it would not grow. You have in your possession all of the things that God has given you. And you didn't do anything to earn them, make them, nurture, or pick them. They're freely yours to decide with what you will do. Our church has a hope that you will give a portion back to God as the giver. And I'm wondering if we can really plant some of the peanuts that we all gathered today in our garden to watch them grow and see what God will do with them. Now, this next part is about our pledging. So if you're not somebody who pledges and not a member yet, you can turn the video off and we thank you for listening. But if you're a member of the family, this information is important for you. As you can see, a major portion of our budget for 2024 and the year before goes to support and compensate me. My salary is listed first and foremost because I take the largest portion of the budget. Also, my continuing education is listed underneath there at 4,800 a year. That used to help me pay for some of my out-of-pocket expenses for college classes. Now it helps me make my student loan payments. Also, my insurance is listed there, and you can see how significant how that impacts the budget. And this year, it is just about going to go up probably at least $1,000 again. Now, it went down last year because I chose a lower plan, and I incurred a lot of health issues this year, so that didn't work out for me personally very well. So I'm going to, again, make a prayerful and thoughtful decision before choosing um, a medical plan. But the balance of the budget there are our normal expenses, keeping the church running. Um, the Sunny School, the music, the advertising and maintenance have all been whacked over the years because those are the places we thought we could cut. Um, and the contingency fund is low at a thousand. Um, but what that is exactly is exactly what a contingency says. What if something happens? We have some money in the budget for that. It used to be a higher number. But I also want to draw your attention to the bottom of the budget. 2024. Um, we had an increase in projected expenses over 2023, of course, about $4,800 there. In 2025, we're going to have projected more expenses than we had in 2024. And so in 2024, I want to show you that our pledges did not meet our budgeted needs. We pledged 84,296 against a budget of 111,000. So we were significantly short, $27,575 for this year. But I've been here a long time. And that used to worry me, I'm sorry. That used to make me lose sleep when that number did not match. 
but I've been at this church a long time and I've learned that the spirit works differently amongst this congregation. And the spirit has a way of bridging this gap, of closing this number. Um, for example, I can tell you that our pledges for 2024 were 84,296, as I just mentioned. But yet, as of now, as of October, we've brought in $92,165 down there on the lower left. 12,000 over what was pledged, and it's only October. Now, that's a good thing. You're thinking, whoo, good, we're bringing in more than we should. That's awesome because our expenses year to date are down there on the right, 94,644. So we're actually short. <laughs> good news and bad news, right? So we can see God provides, but I hope you also see why it's so important that we pledge in our giving. All of our pledges matter to the bottom line, no matter the amount. And you all have been so faithful at pledging that we thank you for always making that commitment. And so today, it's about asking you to make that commitment again. And we ask if you can to, of course, increase it in any way so that we can cover the increase in our expenses as well. Today, Paul has told us that we can go nuts in our giving. And you can pledge any amount at all that comes from your heart after you have prayerfully considered what it should be. You don't plant your seeds willy-nilly, and God isn't asking you to do that here either. He's asking you to thoughtfully consider and then cheerfully give, knowing that all that you give will give back abundance to others. So you have the opportunity, and if you need a pledge sheet, if you want to talk to Diane or myself about giving, you just call the church office and we'll make that happen. But right now I'd ask that you would bow in a moment of prayer with me. Oh, gracious and holy God, we thank you. We know that we have this time in our fellowship and in our family where we have to ask for money. And it's not fun. It's not pleasant. But Lord, when we read your scripture about the promises that what you're going to do with it and what your abilities are, if we are only faithful, we should have nothing to fear. And Lord, you want us to bring our gifts and our pledges to you cheerfully, not with reluctance, not with fear. So Lord, we ask that you would enter into our hearts, awaken the spirit within us, and help us to arrive at a good number that feels good for our family and feels good for our church family. And we pray that you would use that pledge to bless your kingdom and increase it in many ways. We give you praise and thanks for your blessings already, and we give you thanks again for calling us to be your stewards. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in, and we'll let, talk to you next week as we begin our series on gratitude. So take care, and in the meantime, I hope you're well.